the board of directors for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for August 17th, 2023. I'll roll. President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Fulz. Here. Director Ackerman. Here. And I would like to note that Director Ackman is um, participating remotely. Okay. Director Mayhood is not present. And uh, Director Mayhood is still off ill. I uh, motion that we excuse her um, due to medical issue. Do I hear a second? Okay. President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Motion passed. Um, any changes to the uh, closed session agenda? Director Staff have none, sure. Okay. Uh, oral communications uh, reserved for members of the public on items um, that are on the closed session agenda. I see nobody from the public online nor here. I think we can dispense with that. Given that, I think we can adjourn to the closed session. Okay. Scott, you're going to call in that number in there, or do you have it? I have 6.30, so I'd like to reconvene this meeting of the Board of Directors for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for August 17th, 2023. Holly, we can take her roll again. President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Ackman. Here. And Director Mayhood is absent but excused. Thank you. Um, Rick, any uh, additions or deletions? That's sure small there are none. Okay. I'm sorry, were there any actions taken in closed session to oh, report out? Uh, no, there were no actions taken uh, from the discussion in closed session that we have to report. Thank you. Okay. Um, oral communications. Uh, question is reserved for oral communications from anybody from the public. For items that are within the jurisdiction of the district that are not on the agenda for this evening. Um, and I'd like to uh, remind folks that uh, uh, to presentations may not exceed uh, three minutes in length uh, during this oral communications uh, or during uh, comments that members may have uh, during any of the items that we have coming up. So uh, does anybody have anything that's not on the agenda they want to speak about? Seeing nobody here, uh, nor from our attendees online. So if we can proceed. Uh, new business, uh, the uh, exposed infrastructure on uh, Brookside Drive. Rick? Thank you, uh, Mark. This is, a, again, a carryover from our, our last board meeting. Uh, the staff recommends that the board review and comment in regard to Brookside Drive, the winter storm damage uh, main replacement project in early January 2023. Several culverts along Brookside Drive and Felton uh, became clogged by uh, extreme winter uh, runoff and debris uh, during an atmospheric event. 
uh, the Claude Colberts uh, redirected uh, the winter runoff from Shingle Mill Creek uh, onto the roadway, washing out uh, portions of the roadway, uh, blocking access to many homes. When the road uh, erosion on the road occurred, it also uh, damaged and exposed the district's two inch water main located in Brookside Drive. Um, staff responded, uh, restored temporary water service to the homes impacted. As part of the overall storm damage, the district submitted a damage claim to FEMA. Staff is currently working with FEMA to get this project um, obligated, which is approves the scope of the work for replacement, which in turn improves uh, the funding for replacement. Uh, the damage to the road uh, washed out, exposed the main multiple locations, and there was some uh, breaks at the west end of the road. Uh, the proposed replacement and repairs will be a replace approximately 1,650 lineal feet of exposed damage main with new fully restrained eight inch ductile iron pipe to include excavation, bedding, pipe material, um, and appurtenances, valves, fire hydrants, et cetera. Um, the permanent repair costs, uh, including uh, engineering, surveying, and environmental review, and the installation of mainline is estimated at 800,000. Um, District Engineer Josh Wolf made those estim did this estimation from projects that are in construction now, our latest and greatest figures um, that we have. Um, the, to date, the district has procured services for surveying, which is needed for design work. Uh, the surveyors, I do believe he was out yesterday, took some pictures, um, started some preliminary work, and I do believe they hope to have the survey completed by the end of uh, next week. Uh, once the survey is completed, and uh, we will evaluate if the roadway is where it's supposed to be, actually in the right-of-way or on private property, et cetera, and then we will do start the uh, mainline layout uh, plan specifications for replacing uh, the pipeline. Uh, once the, the we have a scope and a project uh, designed, we will then start uh, environmental review. Uh, Shingle Mill Creek, um, the pipe crosses culverts in several locations. It is a repairing corridor, so there will be some substantial environmental work that will need to be done um, before uh, construction. We'll then bid the project after um, environmental review, and it is anticipated that uh, we can start construction of the replacement main uh, early spring 2024. Again, that would be uh, depending on rainfall and, and winter. Um, we have had uh, a couple, several field meets out with uh, residents and phone calls. Um, I, and staff has really uh, emphasized to the homeowners that the exposed main should not impact, you know, clearing debris and so forth, getting into homes. Um, that district staff would stand by or would be available to make repairs to the existing main uh, through our maintenance budget if by removing trees along the road, because there are several trees out that are down and there is uh, some construction work that needs to be done rebuilding the roadway in a, in a couple locations we would work with the homeowners so they can move ahead and pretty much restore that road to pre-existing gravel conditions we do recommend that paving is not completed because we all will be installing a main right up the, uh, pretty much the center of the road depending on where the road lays out after the survey and we wouldn't want to have to tear up fresh pavement. Um, that's just uh, something that uh, we will we'll try to avoid. Uh, the, um, the funding hasn't been approved yet, but even if we had funding obligated and we had the money sitting, uh, it is doubtful, not unless the board would want uh, the district to uh, expedite an emergency install, expedite waive formal bidding procedures, which FEMA would probably disagree and that would jeopardize funding. Uh, and we have still have environmental to move through. So it is doubtful that we would be able to have this constructed any sooner, nonetheless, we did not perform environmental, which I strongly don't recommend. Um, the road has to be repaired before we can put a pipe back in because the district will not be rebuilding the road 
So there is some work that needs to be done out there and you'll need environmental work, uh, environmental review to do any road work out there. They do have a contractor that has been working with them, granite construction, but you know, granite construction is not gonna go in and do work, I doubt, without proper proper permits from the right, right agencies. Um, we have met with a, a homeowner that has uh, experience with EPA funding, has um, given us some contacts for possible alternative funding or other funding for other projects. Um, I've sent that information on to our grant writer and to our environmental planner to look into that because if we don't can't, if we don't use it on this project, we possibly could use it on other projects. Um, that's pretty much my report today. I'd be more than happy to take questions from the board. Okay, all right. Um, why don't we start with you, Jeff? Um, I don't really have a question at this point. Okay, all right, Bob? Uh, yeah. Um, is there an agreement between the community and the district that they can do what they need to do to get back to their homes and be able to do reconstruction as needed all that? I mean, are they in a position to be able to do that? I can't answer that. Well, I mean, until, but, but so the public's here, so. Yes, yeah, so well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, if you don't know, then maybe you guys well, can enlighten Working us. with them, they seem to be agreeable, but then I've received emails that some of the neighborhoods, some of the neighbors didn't seem to be agreeable to that schedule. Well, I mean, I can I can understand. It's it's going to be over a year. So I, you know, I can't speak for for the neighbors, and obviously they are here. But, so right. okay, so they haven't told you that they're good. So maybe they can help enlighten us. Oh, right. So uh, uh, be, um, let, let me interrupt. Um, I'd like uh, for the board to address any questions to, to Rick first. Sure. I would like to hear from the public. This is a pending question, and I agree with Bob's. Yeah, we want to know yeah, what I mean, the public has to say. Yeah, I mean, that's the but, number one question for him. Right. But I have a few others. Um, is it realistic to get the environmental and done and the bid out responded to and selected by spring? Uh, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. Seven months. I, I do believe it's realistic. It will be it will push other projects behind this one. It'll move this top to the list, but this will be contingent. And I will refer to Carly and put you on the spot if the core will get involved. I know you have not been out there, but it depends on the regulatory review and what regulatory agencies. Okay, okay if, the core, if the core is involved, it's not oh, set. I can't answer that. But Carly, maybe Carly can speak to that. It depends on what exact. I, I don't, haven't reviewed the project and where it's right. actually crossing the riparian corridor. Um, and so. we need to get the survey in so we know where the road actually no, no, is. Right. So Look, there's I, some, a few steps I, to jump I, through. I, I get I get that, Rick. If things line up and, and standard project, even so we're in the repairing corridor, if we're not actually digging in the stream, which I don't think we would, and I don't intend to do that, you know, I, I think we could make that schedule. But it will push to the top of the list. Okay. But, I, I mean, I want everybody to know that, that it, there is a big question mark here relative to the environmental review. And, and there's a big question mark on the on, on a lot of things. If we have another El Nino and the district yeah, yeah, has, I mean, there, this is not guaranteed by far, but this is okay. the target that we will we will shoot for. Okay, I I, I just want to be crystal clear with the community as to what we're looking at here. That, that's all. Um, I understand about the survey. We had an issue recently up where I live that you yeah, know always the road. Yeah, the wasn't in the road. Um, culvert responsibility. Um, it was this is this a private road and is the culvert responsibility the responsibility of the uh, owners of, of the road or it, the district was not is not planning to take on the responsibility of road I, I building or culvert I, I didn't i didn't ask that i asked who's who owns the road do you know who owns the do road not okay so maybe so, we can have them address yeah, that as well if the public knows that if, if they know it right. uh, well i mean it's either a county road a county and maintained road or a private road that's but that's the choices in the county. Or each individual parcel could own the road. Yeah. But yeah. that's still a private yes. road. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, when did we identify as a district, when did we identify this as an issue? Storm damage issue? When did we identify this situation as an issue? Okay, right. When it happened. Okay. At the beginning of the year, when we had the outages we responded to when the actual flooding. Okay, and this was on the project list that we assembled. I 
I don't know yes. that I've seen yeah. a project list yet. Yes. For this, but this has been a FEMA there. project from, from when it has happened. Okay. Uh, a service order was um, was produced and it went it submitted to FEMA right away. Is there a reason that we didn't engage a surveyor right away or back in April or May when things dried out a little bit? I don't have the exact dates, but there was a time that you, we couldn't even get in there. PG&E wasn't going in there. There was trees down. Um, we looked at it. We had everybody back in water, so it wasn't a top emergency to get in okay. because folks were restored in water relatively quickly. Okay. And uh, what kind of risks do we think the, are going to be to the pipe if they do what they need to do, taking out trees and that sort of thing? Are we looking at effectively having to replace the exposed you know, the pipe looks like it's located where it's exposed in the center of the road so that when vehicles travel, but it, it depends. It, it potentially could get damaged, dragging trees and so forth. It's a small main. We will move right in and fix it under the maintenance budget. Okay. And by right in, that means like same day and so same, day, same day yeah. and hopefully hours. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one of our board members is participating uh, remotely this evening. Jamie? Any questions on this? Um, well, you know, I, I heard Rick say that there are projects that will get pushed down the list um, in order to accelerate some of this work. And I'm I'm not opposed to that necessarily. I think it's, you know, when we're trying to accommodate um, customers, that does come at a higher um, priority for me than projects where, you know, the the, the Sequencing can be um, done without directly affecting other private work um, for homeowners who are trying to go through the recovery process themselves. So all that's to say, I really appreciate that you have taken these steps to try and push this forward. But I, I do want to sort of understand what kind of long downstream effects, if you forgive the pun, um, that this might have for other projects that may also be very critical. Um, is there anything, you know, do you, do you have visibility into that, Rick? I don't know if I've heard because you're kind of broken. Did you ask what that would happen if I pushed that project to the top of the list? What, what the impact would be on other projects? Well, there'd be some impact, but, it, you know, and most of this will be consultants. We will send out for the have it designed, and then it will just be staff review. Um, a lot of the other projects aren't, aren't obligated yet, some of the bigger projects. Um, and, Jamie, it would be typical for us to move a project of this nature where the road was going to be being paved to the top of the list um, to make sure that, you know, we wouldn't go in and destroy payment. And we've done that in other situations. Good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Along the lines of what Bob was asking earlier, um, can we issue the request for proposals uh, next uh, based on staff availability? Can we issue those requests for proposals soliciting for engineering design firm and for environmental reviews? Move that because that's the first step that we need to take in mm -hmm. both of those aspects. We'd like to get the survey done first so we know what we're up against right. um, once the survey is done, which the survey should be, uh, what is it typically on a return of a survey? Um, but a month, two weeks? Yeah, like maybe two weeks. But, but it's going to take staff time on both of those aspects to prepare all of the, all of the back, background information. Um, the survey is part of it, is part of what the engineering package at least goes out with. Uh, you're arguing for parallel, not serial. Exactly. Right. I understand that. Yes. I, I, I don't like to rush. The, I, I know. What you, I know what you guys are looking for, Staff. but I do not like to rush the project, the process, because this is when we make mistakes and things get. I, I, he's not asking for rushing. I'm not saying rush it. I'm saying staff availability and staff prioritize this. Yes. I'm not saying cut any corners on this. No. But simply that. I still don't believe it'll get the project installed any sooner than spring, because that's a pretty 
But I, that's but a I, pretty ambitious schedule I, to get to that. That's, that's not what he's saying either. I'm not saying it. I'm saying, can we, this is the first step that we would need to take. I would hope that we're not back at this point in November saying, oh, well, then now we need to get a design consultant. No, I want to see what we can do to, to begin to move this along because uh, on other projects that are of a more uh, pressing nature, it, uh, it could take us a while. So can we get based on staff availability to get those procedural aspects to issue the RPs? We can try. That's that's where the staff time comes in to start doing that, and that's what is our yes. problem right now. Yeah. They're working on other steps. Okay. So we have a considerable construction project going on with Strikes staff right now. Okay. All right. Um, I did see uh, mentioned in one of the emails about the possibilities of uh, some other federal funding aspects. Uh, they mentioned two specific ones. Can we get our grant writer involved? Already have. Okay. Sent, already sent that email out to both okay. Carly and our grant writer to investigate. Okay. All right. So, so, just as long as it's not USDA uh, type uh, funding. <laughs> so can we hear back from that at a subsequent board meeting? Then? Just yes, the status of that is. Okay. Um, and then um, you're going from two inch pipe to eight inch pipe. That's correct. Tell us why. Higher flow. Okay. Good. That's what I expect. Okay. Uh, those are all the questions that I have. Um, so, Bob, you asked two questions that Rick had to uh, beg off on that we think that somebody from the public can address. Um, I'm looking for customer satisfaction. Uh, I have, results yeah, here, right? yeah, that's okay. Uh, so, based on what uh, the discussions Rick has had with you at this point, uh, is this sound reasonable because I think what I'm hearing is we can go do other work in there. But getting a tree off of somebody else's house, we can be there, repair law. Does this sound like an acceptable approach? And okay. Or, um, or the best of you the took the lead last yes. time all thank you. Or the best of the worst well, approach. Thank you for your questions. Please, uh, if you can go to the mic, oh, so that, okay. uh, because I don't know how well your voice is then heard by others. No. Yes. And may I ask you to identify yourself and where you're from? Yes, my name is Chris Keller. I live at 899 Brookside Drive. This is Ed Kofi and Steve Farrow. And we were here two weeks ago. We're three of the 12. Um, so we speak for all of our community. and. This timeline is frustrating for a lot of them. Uh, four of those uh, still cannot access their homes. Two of them have the trees still in the home. Uh, so for those folks, uh, this timeline is outrageous uh, just because it's been eight months and we have spent eight months trying to get this onto Rick's you know, radar. Um, unfortunately, it took coming here two weeks ago for him to return my phone calls. So when my neighbors uh, hear his timeline about spring, they are livid because they are renting in, in rentals. Um, one gentleman, 75 years old, has been going every weekend and chiseling that tree from his home because he can't get a crane or a crew up there. And so that's frustrating for, for him. That's frustrating for all of us. Um, so the timeline is... Um, I don't know. It's 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 disappointing uh, that we've wasted so much time and that we're almost in, in the winter again. So they're all concerned that this is just going to happen again. So um, one point about the environmental. Um, I know Fish and Wildlife is expediting permits as it relates to disaster. And this is, um, we received FEMA funding through the 4683 disaster. And we're currently um, applying for 4699 to get the funds to do all of this. Uh, but they are expediting permits. Uh, this is Ed. He is the one that works. Uh, in, well, I didn't know if you want to tell them your title. <laughs> oh, okay. so, before you, and, right. and I would like to respond to each one and not as degree yes. to these. Hang on a second. 
And who owns the road? And is it a private road? It is a private road. Okay, so the culvert so, maintenance would have been homeowners. Homeowners. So that we have been doing that because the district, you know, does not come when we have a clogged culvert. So we hire someone to do it out of sorry, our, which district? Not our. It's not our road. So we. Yeah, so it's a, it's a private road, and right. we understand that that you guys actually don't have responsibility right. over the culverts. Okay, thank you. The pipes, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's what we're speaking to. Okay. Um, the culverts are under the, the what we would hope granite construction would do is to sort of reinforce those culverts. Okay. I'm thank sorry. You. Would you identify yourself, please? I'm Ed Coffee at 956. Okay. So. Uh, well, this time, Rick, you, yes, please respond. I mean, I, I have, you know, I understand their frustration and they want to get this done, but the pipeline didn't preclude you guys getting to your home, didn't preclude you guys moving in and removing trees and so forth. No one, I asked Josh Wolf, our district engineer, our past district engineer, he was working with several of the homeowners on moving this project forward. And to say that we kept you and keeping today, People from entering their homes. It's just not true. You can get, I drove up to the last house and he met me out front and said, Yeah, I can't get propane. I understand that. But that's not from our pipe. It's from the road washed out. They won't go around the trees. I've, I've been up there and I, I sympathize, but I don't, I think we should make sure that we have straight facts. Don't tell the board and, and me that we're stopping you to get, get home. That's not true. You can drive in. And you break the pipe, we'll fix it. The pipe is not that bad. It's exposed, it's not up to standard, and yes, it needs to be replaced. But we're not holding you back from fixing the road, fixing culverts, we'll work with you. Yes, but why didn't you tell us this eight months well, ago? I had, Josh Wolf was working with you. Yes, and I met with Josh. Yeah, uh, and so we were started. working, we were working with you all to move this ahead. And we have a lot of projects. And I'm not saying that, you know, that your project isn't important, but we had you in water right after it happened. We made sure you were in water. Yes. And then the next is to move in and do the repairs. So, I, I mean, I, I think you should work with us a little better and don't come in and tell me that I'm stopping you from getting home or getting the trees out of the houses. Your area was hit the worst I saw. <laughs> that Brookside Drive took it hard. There is no doubt in my mind. And we want to get in and replace that pipe, but it's going to take a little bit of time for us to do it. When did you first see Brookside Drive? Uh, the car was in the hole still when I was okay. up there. So that was three weeks ago. So we, whenever that uh, was, I was up there. One of the neighbors got a bobcat and moved trees. Yeah, and no one was there. I mean, I didn't talk to anybody. Then the next time I went up, I talked to the guy who lives at the, the end of the street. Right. And Josh went out there, and the, uh, the director of operations went out there right after the fact. And Josh put together a project description for FEMA. I, you know, I, I know you guys want to get this done. I don't blame But we do have a process to go through. And we're moving, I think, pretty fast compared to other projects that are three Great. or four years old. I so, left several messages. Um, um, yeah, I, I can understand the frustration, and I'm sensing. Yeah, I'm sorry, just... and, and, Rick, and and I understand that it's it's taken a while. Um, and from residents' perspective, maybe the district wasn't out there as soon as what residents thought they should have been. Um, I can't speak to what staff was doing otherwise. What we can talk about, I think better is, what are we doing going forward? Because I can't change what happened last right. week or, or last month, um, unless it's what happened then shouldn't happen now and we can improve on it. So I hear Rick saying that as far as the, the tree that's in place, if if a home mover will give us notice, we could have staff available. If that line breaks, we can get it fixed. Right. I, I, have, so, I have a question. If this is, I think I just want to say, I, I think one of the points of contention and why there's frustration is because of the lack of coordination. It's not so much that you think that you're doing nothing, but the perception, however, is that no one has come out to the road 
right? I mean, three weeks ago, I believe was the first time yeah. whoever it was to see the, the vehicle before it was pulled out, right? So we're talking about coordination at least a face-to-face. -face. We haven't okay. had that. We were just barely getting to that place. So I think that's where the frustration yeah. lies. We also know that it's not your fault that any of this happened, right? And and that the, I think where the frustration lies again is just in that coordination is if we could have gotten to this, we had gotten initial rollout of funding from FEMA for individual homes at $31,000 per home. Um, we could have gotten started on hasty phases, but we had waited for the contact from you guys before we even consider moving any dirt because of considerations for that pipeline and its aging and your aging infrastructure. So that that was really the reason why we held back. We understand that we could have gone, we could have proceeded, mm -hmm. but we were consulting with people, and our concern was that pipeline, what we might do with it. I have even gone out and told neighbors to not firm up because you're going to break that pipe. Um, and our road is, is is in a situation where it becomes harder for folks to come up even for you, for you guys. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so, yes, Bob wants to comment. I, I, well, I, the question is, I'm, I'm still not clear on this. I, I need to get clarity on this. Can you or can you not get equipment up to the last house on the road to get the tree uh, and the other house to get the tree off the house? No. Okay. So how do we... I mean, is that our? Not, is it not, now? Is not that properly? No. Now, is that due to the road being out? It's the, that's due to the condition of the road. And so, like, like road. Okay. Chris has said, we've been this neighbor's been essentially cutting his tree to pieces, yeah. uh, a dug fir, in, uh, to pieces, so that it can move from the property. And so, this being besides the the point, though, uh, uh, of the pipes and the right. construction, but this. We got into this place because, again, we we've been waiting for that contact and that coordination, and we're we're barely getting there. So that's that's where the frustration is. It's it's on the board's radar now. Yes, I I can say that it wasn't on our radar until two months ago, which, which makes our point. Right. Mark, can I ask a question? Our engineer is working with yeah. those folks. Um, yeah, Just a minute, Jamie. I mean, it was on our radar. Josh was out there working with, I don't know who he met with, but he was representing my office. I talked to Lucindra two or three times over the last month on the project. I, I just mean, I, I don't think you're getting the right information. I, I, wasn't, getting, I wasn't aware of this. I didn't know anything was going on. Right. I don't think the rest of the board okay. was to this degree. To this I, have, degree. I have one question so, for you, gentlemen. Um, we have three of you there representing your neighbors, and I'm assuming that the rest of most most of the rest of the people are here are also your neighbors. Have you, as a group, designated a person to be the primary contact so that Rick has someone that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's me. Is, is okay. that your understanding also, Rick? I've been contacted by several different people. Okay, okay. so I think one, one and I, way... I don't know if it's an actual road association or it's just... Okay. Usually if it's a, a road association, there is right. a designated person. In January or when the storms hit, we established Chris as that point of contact. Yeah, so, okay. so in a situation okay. like this, it's best to have contact point, contact point, and you yeah. represent your contact people and you represent the district. And that way we keep the communication straight and we don't have well, we people can't, saying, well, somebody was out here with a truck last week and I don't know what he wanted. And, you know, our neighbors to we, have frustrated. We, we have established Chris as that person, but right. whoever's making contact with whoever, okay. we okay. can't help. We just wanted to make sure that we had a clear line of um, contact. Okay. Um, Jamie, you have another comment or question? I have a question for um, the speakers. When did you get confirmation of your FEMA funding? Last of it was uh, May, March. Between we, March. We got our first payments in March, mm -hmm. and then they sort of rolled in after that. So, yes, yeah, so in March. I mean, the other March the other through people, May time frame. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the other aspect of this too is the fact that with inflation the way it is, every day that goes by, yeah. they're, they're losing money. Right. Yeah. We're, we're taking right. money out of the pocket. So, so other question too on this on the FEMA funding, you applied to a special FEMA program, as I understand it, for homeowners associations, road private road associations. Are they private roads? Yes. Yeah. Are they 
prioritizing those projects over public agencies like us because we find FEMA to be very, very slow in, yeah, yeah. in processing. FEMA, FEMA is FEMA's only worried about emergency response. Yeah. Um, so I worked for the US Army, had worked at the US Army Corps of Engineers. I was the Deputy Public Affairs Officer. I'm currently a writer editor for the Environmental Protection Agency of Region 9. Um, not as big a position in my previous at the Army Corps of Engineers, mm -hmm. but I've been on emergency response and I've seen how fast FEMA can respond. FEMA walks up to a certain line and it's up to the next agency to take it over. So right now you have a situation where EPA should be stepping in, but EPA doesn't step in until you reach out. And I've given contacts at the early at the earliest point of this when this happened, with you, see with P, mm -hmm. the Army Corps, and from the uh, and from the US EPA. So those things can be expedited given the considerations of the situation that we are in currently. And I'm not talking about $15 million in a private loan. Mm -hmm. I'm talking $100 million that can begin that could have been delivered to you on low interest, as well as forgiven. Expedite. I'm as calm as I can possibly be. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be calm. Mm -hmm. But again, I've been out of my house on emergency response for a portion two. Well, I can't get help on our road. Mm -hmm. Guam, now Hawaii, right? So this is where we're at. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I understand that there's a, there's a process. But in this situation, I know the process can be expedited. Okay. So. Um, you've heard uh, what Rick has had to say at this point, and what our plans are going forward. Um, we don't have a motion in front of us. I expect this is going to be a uh, an item that's going to be on uh, future agendas to update not only us, the board, but the public also. Uh, what is your next step then, Rick, with this, other than the, the survey that you told us about? Well, we'll start with the plan specifications. And the RFPs. The RFPs. Okay. Mm -hmm. For those. And, and then we'll start, you know, reaching out to regulatory agencies on uh, CEQA. Okay, and that can be done concurrent, but we can't start the sequel process until we have plans and specifications, or at least a a plan. Right. Okay. And that and it sounds like then that'll slow down. That'll go pretty quick to that point, but then it will slow down, and we'll pull, we'll we'll reach out to a consultant, do an RFP, and and have a consultant do the the plan specifications. We'll just pay to have it done. I mean, I would I would hope that whoever's reviewing this understands the situation and would take this to the top of the triage. This well, is you know exactly the, how it's going to go. Uh, with these regulatory I mean, po possi and that. Possibly, but so, this is where you start talking about triage on emergencies. Yeah. Well, if he can't get his truck up there, well, and we still don't there. have. Go I mean, out there and drive up to the end of the road. If if he can't get the truck up there to get the tree off, then I I don't see a solution here yet. He can't get a crane, right? Can you get anybody? It's a crane he's talking about, a big crane. Okay, right. but can you get anybody? Get a pickup, anybody and, 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 get a pickup and, up there. Light vehicles but, up there. But, but, but wait, I think you've already identified that getting the crane up there is a condition of the road. Right. Right. It's not. Can you can pipe. you get can right. you get Pilgrim right. or Christian or a pipe. smaller right. truck? Right. right. So I don't think that that's an issue. Well, PG&E got their cranes board. and their trucks in there because they replaced poles, didn't they? Okay. okay. But the, removing you know, the tree, yeah. they went up where the trees are on the houses. But, but, but removing the tree, I don't think is something that we can. No, it's, not, it's not our responsibility. It's, or the on, guys. Or it's not our responsibility. It's point of which we're, we're talking about. Right. It's, understand. it's not our responsibility to do, but we're in the critical path on that. If now, can you get a smaller truck up to you know cut it up into smaller pieces? That's, and that's what's happened. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so Rick, it sounds like in addition to uh, complete the survey, get RFPs prepared. Uh, you're working with the grant writer, so you have some things here that you can begin. Yeah, we'll we'll flesh out FEMA before we go for a loan. Okay. Uh, or yeah. or we look at other grants, I, but we're not gonna. You don't have to. You can apply for a for a with you right now today, um, and we'll look into that. Okay. okay. Can we Thank put together a checklist of all of? Can we put together a checklist of the steps that we need to do 
and keep it current between them and us sure. so that uh, we we both sides know exactly where we are. Appreciate that. That would yeah. be helpful. And I want to apologize, Rick. I didn't mean to get personal. That's just we are very frustrated and I'm venting the frustration from my neighbors. Uh, so I'm happy to work with you and I appreciated your phone call two weeks ago after the last meeting. Um, and you also spoke to Josh and we have been working with neighbors. Lucinda, I talked to several times. Josh has been out there. I mean, we have been working with you. I just want to make sure. We've not made any progress. So, you know, and especially if we've had months of a gap. That's where a checklist would help. Yeah, a checklist would task, be wonderful. Task, task, check them off when they're done. We understand where you're at. <laughs> that would relieve a lot of the tension that we're feeling. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we're- Yes. We, we <laughs> we're discussed as far as we can at this yeah. point then on this. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. No, thank you for your time. Okay. Great time here. Thanks. And we will be discussing it at a future meeting. Okay. If I may, <clears throat> John James and I, live up the hill for these folks on Lost Acre Drive. And uh, I envy neither them nor you guys having to work with so many crisis situations, which in a way uh, the uh, uh, world is going may get even more frequent. And you don't have to answer me, but talk among yourselves as to whether you have enough hands to do the work, because there's a lot of it out there. Okay. Thanks, John. Okay, uh, moving on then. Um, item 10B, since we do not have any motion to deal with there, uh, the stream flow uh, monitoring. And I will ask uh, our district environmental planner to present this item to the board and public, please. Carly? Thank you, Rick. So in 2014, the district began a long-term streamflow and water quality monitoring program to collect and record streamflow and diversion data. This data is used to inform regulatory agencies, assist with operations, and establish baselines for future projects. In 2019, the district refined the monitoring program and reduced the number of gauges uh, to only gauge non-op or only gauge operational diversions. Um, so in, 20, in April 2023, the district released a request for proposals for qualified firms to complete the 2023, the 2025 streamflow salinity and temperature monitoring operational gauging program. The RFP closed on June 8th, 2023, and two proposals were received. Uh, we received one proposal from Balance Hydrologics and another from CBEC Inc. Eco Engineering, and both are included in the agenda packet for review. Uh, both firms met all the requirements of the RFP and were qualified. Staff is recommending Balance Hydrologics for the contract due to their local experience, history with the district's monitoring and gauging program, and their total budget for the 2325 pro uh, program. The cost for the three year program is $118, 181 and 85 cents, and staff is prepared to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, it looks fairly straightforward. It's just from a presentation point of view, it's always great to have a table or something summarizing the financial part of it. I had to go look um, for it, and it looks like Allen's Hydrologics is actually lower cost, correct? So that's yeah. that's actually a, you know, flashing type thing you want to highlight So when, in your report. Um, yeah, I mean, they've been doing this for a while, and have been doing a good job on it. And yeah, we don't need to do more than we're more streams than we're doing now. We collected a ton of information during that five-year period. So uh, let's go. Jamie, questions on this? No questions. Okay, Jeff? No questions. Okay, uh, I have one, Carly. Uh, balance includes uh, 15,000 uh, for contingency. Uh, who controls that money? And uh, do we need that? Right. So in the past, we have used contingency for different data requests that we had for balance. So if we needed something analyzed or a lot of times we're not getting reports back at this point. So we've dropped that off of the, the proposal or their budget. So we have gone back to them to ask for that data and that would use up some extra hours. And that would likely come to Rick for authorization uh, to use the contingency. Okay. 
So if we're not getting reports on an ongoing basis, which cost us mm -hmm. having this there instead for the one-off requests periodically. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense there. And it's not uh, balance has that money already. It's through our request of additional work. We need you to do this. Tell us what this is going to be. Exactly. All right. That's another uh, 16 hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to write this stuff then. Okay. Um, then I'd like to move um, that the board direct the district manager to enter into a contract with balance uh, hydrologics in the amount not to exceed 119000 for the purposes of 2023-25 stream flow, salinity, and temperature monitoring and operational gauging program. So I made a motion. Second. Thank you. <laughs> um, it took me so long to get to the end of that. So, um, okay. But it was a complete motion. Mm -hmm. Correct. It was. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Uh, before we uh, take a vote on that, any members of the public uh, wish to comment on this? Seeing none here, seeing none online. Uh, Holly? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Foles? Yes. Director Ackerman? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on, the uh, conjunctive use update modeling contract award. Yes, and uh, the environmental planner, Carly Blanchard, will present this to the board. Right, thank you. So tonight we do have Mike Podlek, our fisheries biologist on the project, as well as Chris Hammersmark, the director from CBEC Engineering, to co-present an update on conjunctive use and a proposed technical support scope and budget. Um, Scott, if you wouldn't mind. Pulling up the slideshow. Okay. Scott, do you mind scrolling through the slides for me? Okay, we can go to the first slide. So just because we haven't brought this item to the board for some time, I wanted to give a, a quick update or a little brief summary of what conjunctive use is. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're competing. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, this first slide is really just an overview of what the conjunctive use plan is and kind of the history. Um, so the goal is to identify opportunities for improving the reliability of surface and groundwater supplies throughout the district's jurisdiction, uh, while also increasing stream-based flows for fish. Um, as part of the conjunctive use plan, we created two supporting documents, the water availability assessment and the fisheries resource considerations assessment. And uh, right now, the district is working on an environmental impact report as part of the CEQA analysis. A few years ago, we did complete an initial study. Um, however, we, we received some concerns and decided to move into an EIR, or the environmental impact report. So just as a review um, of, of the water availability assess, or analysis, or the WAA as we call it, uh, this document looked through 24 conjunctive use scenarios for the district. It was focused primarily on water supply reliability and sustainability with a particular emphasis on groundwater sustainability. And it was based on simulated monthly flows. So this document was used to feed into the conjunctive use plan as well as our operational planning and will be worked into our environmental impact report. The WAA also, thank you, Scott. <laughs> Forgot I wasn't controlling it. <laughs> I'm controlling it at my computer, but it's not going. <laughs> um, so the fisheries resource considerations assessment was built off of the WAA and it's a planning level analysis of fisheries effects of district selected water availability analysis scenarios. Um, it used the WAA simulated flow results and stream flow monitoring data, and it did not establish habitat flow relationships or in-stream flow needs. Uh, Mike Podlick did write this document. I don't know, Mike, if you wanted to jump in here and add any information. Uh, not at this point. Okay, perfect. All right, next slide. All right, so just as a, an overview of the existing operations for the district. 
We have a North system that only uses or that uses both surface water and groundwater sources. We have our South system that is groundwater surface source only. Sorry. And then our Felton system is surface water only. And we have emergency inner ties that run between North Felton, North South, and then South to Scotts Valley Water District. Uh, not currently used as our operations is our Loch Loman allotment, which is 314 acre feet a year. Um, that was an agreement that we entered with the city after we sold some land for them to build their Loch Loman Reservoir. Um, we also do have a water right in Lompico or Zianti. Uh, however, we did file a petition to dedicate that water back to the stream. Um, that's a 1707 petition, pet petition that we submitted. So that is in process. Next slide. Um, we just went through this on the last item, but we are working on a stream flow and temperature monitoring program. Um, it's been a five year of extensive gauging from 2014 to 2018, and that included agency input and annual updates. Um, this really did capture a broad range of water type years. Uh, we had very wet periods and then very dry periods within that range. So it's a really good summary of what it looks like in our operations and our diversions, as well as our streams. Um, this also included water temperature effects analysis by Don Alley, another fisheries biologist in the area. And then we did reduce the scope in 2019. Um, and we also had pretty limited data in the past few years due to the CZU fires and then our 2023 storms. We lost gauges. Uh, we did put them back after the 2020, or the 2020 CZU. However, we did have the big storms that took out most of the gauges again. So entering into a new contract, we'll reinstall all those gauges and get our data back online. Next slide. Um, so the review uh, or the revised conjunctive use project description from the initial study, we have updated or changed a few of the project um, needs. So right now we're looking at taking our inner ties and making them usable for non-emergency use. Uh, so that'll be analyzed in our environmental impact report to understand what those potential impacts are. We're also looking to understand what the transfer of unused potential diversions would be throughout the district and what those impacts could potentially be on our streams. And then we also are analyzing the Loch Lomond allotment and how that would fit into our system, how we would bring it into our system and how we would treat it. Uh, we are in the process of releasing a Loch Lomond feasibility study RFP or uh, request for proposals. And hopefully we'll have that back soon and that'll give us more information on what we'd need to do to upgrade our treatment plants, as well as where we would tie in with the city of Santa Cruz and tie up some discussions we need to have with the city as well. Another piece is we do need to change our place of use for our Felton water rights. So right now, our water right only allows us to use Felton water within Felton, and we'd like to be able to move that throughout the jurisdiction of our, our water district. Not included is the changes to the big trees gauge uh, water right restriction that we have there, and then aquifer uh, storage and recovery or ASR. We're, no, we're not uh, analyzing either of those in this EIR. And Mike, this might be another place that you might have interest in jumping in, so I'll give you a... <laughs> no, I think you, you summarized it great, and if there's any questions uh, afterwards, I'd be happy to, to uh, okay. answer those. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Great, next slide. So the next steps to move the EIR forward, um, we did award a contract to Rincon Consultants in August of 2022. Uh, they were the original consultant that completed the initial study. Um, so we felt that it made sense to move them into the EIR process and they are on board. However, we've had some delays due to all the emergencies we run into, as well as getting a better understanding of exactly what our operations would look like with Loch Lomond brought online, as well as how we would exactly move, when, and how much water from our diversions. Uh, we did lose all the North System diversions in the CZU fires. Uh, we currently have one online, which is Foreman Creek. We're also working uh, right now to model some different climate change impacts, as well as understand what the impacts could potentially be to the city of Santa Cruz operations by increasing our, our diversions during high flows, and then as well as the Loch Lomond allotment and what that would do for their um, temperatures and their HCP that they just went to, or their habitat conservation plan. 
And uh, we originally uh, brought Rincon on to update the project description at a 30,000 um, purchasing authority and then awarded them the contract in August, just as a side note. Next slide. Um, we recently brought on CBEC Eco Engineering to help us get a better understanding of what we would need to do to complete the EIR, including water right place of use changes and associated water diversion permitting. Uh, we did enter into another thirty thousand uh, dollar purchasing authority <laughs> under Rick's uh, district manager purchasing authority. <laughs> the initial scope began the preliminary hydraulic and habitat modeling on Boulder Creek, which is the confluence of Foreman and Peabine Creeks, and streamflow data processing for operational planning, with the idea that the comprehensive scope and budget would be developed based on needs defined upon establishing the work in this initial contract. Uh, since the modeling kickoff, CBEC has proposed the attached scope of work, or actually it's in the board packet. Scott, I think you might've jumped ahead, but <laughs> there we go. Um, the work presented in the proposed budget includes the 30,000 initially authorized. So we're actually asking for $71,674 with a $10,000 contingency. And I'll allow Chris uh, to jump in here and explain what we've done thus far and what we would do if the work is completed or the contract is approved. Sounds good. Thank you, Carly. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Hammersmark. I'm a director at Seabeck Eco Engineering. I run our Santa Cruz branch office. We're based down in Seabright. We have five local staff that support your needs as well as many of your partner agencies. In fact, we're conducting streamflow monitoring for Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. Right. Mm -hmm. um, CBEC was asked to provide three tasks. They're summarized here. The first is assess changes in habitat availability and fish passage due to changes in flow on Boulder Creek. The second was to synthesize without project or natural daily stream flow records for use by others in the CUP EIR CEQA. How about that for some alphabet soup um, <laughs> analysis? And then lastly, we've been asked to um, modify, scale those records to future potential hydrology scenarios with various climate change um, analyses added. And we're doing that, well, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. So next slide, please, Scott. So the first task was to look at habitat fish passage on Boulder Creek. Uh, the previous work that Mike provided um, asserted that the district's diversions shouldn't affect and the local and the, the regulatory agencies in general agreed, but they said we need something hard to point to to support that, that professional opinion. And that's why um, Mike brought us in. And so we are working on a roughly 350 foot reach of Boulder Creek, pretty close to the bottom, right over there. And it, is, it was chosen as representative reach of Boulder Creek, meaning the conditions there should reflect um, what fish steelhead in particular experience elsewhere along Boulder Creek. Um, to conduct this work, we, we provided a detailed survey. Next slide, please, Scott. And with that, we were able to develop a DEM of the reach. With that, and this just shows you the DEM and the various survey points. Actually, could you go back one slide? Just what we're really trying to get at is the picture on the left. You see a, you see a riffle with threads of water going through, and we are, we would have been tasked with estimating at what point, how low does flow have to drop such that an adult steelhead could not swim through that ripple. So that's that's more or less what we're trying to get at. And then you see the pool downstream of it. We're effectively being asked to say, how much does an increment change in flow affect the availability of rearing habitat or habitat for baby fish to get bigger before they head out to the ocean? Next slide, please. So first we collected the detailed hydraulic or uh, detailed topographic survey. We use that to build a 2D hydraulic model, which we then are able to run scenarios and evaluate hydraulic conditions. Next slide. So these are some of the preliminary results from the hydraulic modeling on the left side. We can see that it's hard at this scale. I apologize, but on the left is a lower flow condition, 18 CFS, and then presenting the depth of water. On the right is 59 CFS and the resulting depth of water. We are currently running a suite of other flows, primarily at the lower end, 
to analyze at what point the flow through the three riffles that are um, provided or included within our reach, at what point does the depth get less than 0.6 foot deep and narrower than two feet? And those are the criteria that we're, we are, we work with the resource agencies to identify us as passable for ceiling. So we, we will use the model and then see at what point it would technically become impassable. And then, and then Mike, in doing his fisheries analysis and looking at changes in flow based off of various potential outcomes due to the conjunctive use plan, uh, would any of those affect that? Would, would we get to a point on Boulder Creek where flow dip below and because of your upstream diversions, passage could potentially be impacted or delayed? So that, that's what we're currently working on. We built the model. We're currently, the model's been run. We're currently doing the analysis and reporting. So we're, we're a good chunk of the way through this particular task. Next, next slide. Uh, the next piece is to prepare daily stream flow records to then again, analyze how various conjunctive use, um, various alternatives could affect those stream flow. As we just heard, uh, the district has been working with balanced hydrologics to provide hydrologic data on the streams of interest. And this value has been, or this data has been incredibly valuable for our process. So it, it, we are relying very heavily upon the past work that you've invested in. Um, we have, as Carly mentioned, we are looking at the 2014 through 2018 period because it, it uh, captures a very wide range of hydrology. We don't need to look at 100 years. We can look at nearly the driest year on record and one of the wettest years on record within those and then a couple intermediate. And so they provide a good range of, of hydrologic years for us to evaluate potential impacts or effects. Our job was to compile those data and then to fill in some gaps in those data because at times gauges go out or, or there are other um, issues. Next slide, please. Again, this is the, the gauging system that uh, Balance has been working on and will continue for you. Uh, I'm not going to really summarize that too much, but we were able to develop a daily stream flow record for all of these locations from April 15, 2014 to September 30th, 2018, giving us about four and a half years to analyze in future efforts. Next slide, please. So some of the gaps were ranged from a few weeks to a few months. Uh, Foreman Creek had a two-year gap that we needed to synthesize, and so it wasn't really just going in and filling in a day here or a day there. There was, there was decent chunks that needed to be uh, synthesized. Next, next slide, please. This is an example of one of the hydrographs. So this is from water year 2017 at Fall Creek. The blue line is showing what the gauge record was. The orange are periods that we filled in based off of linear regression from other nearby gauges. And so we had to go through and, and look at the various data pairings and see which one uh, simulated the flows or which were most co closely correlated. And then we use that to fill in those gaps. So we did that on, on all nine sets of records and at various, various different points in the record. Next slide, please. That's another example of on Peabine Creek where we had to fill in a, a section of an early flow there. Next slide, please. As you're all aware, the flows that are monitored have been altered by upstream diversions. And so the next step was to add those diversions back in such that we had a without project or natural condition to then apply potential future diversions to. Next slide, please. So this is an example of what one of those looks like after we've taken the, the monthly diversion records from the district and added them back to the daily hydrographs that we had developed previously. Next slide, please. So we are, we are done with the gap filling analysis at this point. And what is left for us to do is the climate change analysis where we take these various hydrologies that we've developed that were measured and then have been um, completed so that they're continuous and scale them for potential future climate change effects of temperature and precipitation. We don't have one answer on what the future may be. And so a suite of potential scenarios are being used. 
We're working very closely with the city of Santa Cruz to utilize identical methods to what they did as, as a means to not have them have an issue with what we've done in the future. So we're working really closely with them. We're communicating what we're doing. And they're saying, yes, that sounds good, such that when we come back to them, we anticipate there will not be the same sort of pushback that was received last time. Next slide. Back to you, Carly. Great. Yeah, so we can go ahead and take some questions. Um, we're ready to respond to anything you guys have questions on. Um, and it looks like Jamie has uh, left the building. Uh -oh. Yes, left, left the meeting, is that correct? She said she was gonna leave about 7.15. Yeah, okay. So she has signed okay. up. Uh, Bob? Yeah. Um, first of all, on the presentation, that wasn't in our packet, correct? That's correct. Will that be posted on the website? It'll be, yes, we'll post it to the website and add it to the minutes as well. Great. Thank you. Um, is the process that you're going through something that could have been done within the construct of negotiations around an ISMD? Potentially. Um, a lot of this work will feed into our permitting with the regulatory agencies as well. Um, Mike, it looks like you're stepping in as well. <laughs> Do you want to answer that? Um, <clears throat> I mean, the original ISMD that, that we prepared and that Santa Cruz almost exclusively pushed back on um, forcing a EIR, but I'm kind of curious whether or not this kind of analysis could have been done as a supplemental to the ISM and D to avoid the huge expense of the EIR. I don't think I can respond directly to that question, but um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read the comment letter that the city provided on the ISM and D. The, you know, the first half of that was um, legal arguments regarding how this project really uh, requires to be analyzed under a full EIR versus an ISMND. And, you know, as a fisheries biologist, I'm not qualified to, to comment on what, what the legal um, uh, validity of those arguments are, but I think that the um, council, uh, legal council that uh, the district was receiving at the time said that, yeah, this is, um, you know, the, that there are some valid points, and that um, and the decision was made to to move forward with a with an EIR. Um, so it, it it was really that decision that kind of um, was the impetus for the more rigorous analysis. So no, it it wouldn't have been done as part of of the ISMND, and and I don't think just doing that additional analysis and then we're still kind of trying to process it under. Um, ISM and D um, would have it, put it this way: it, it may have still been challenged simply because um, of the because I think the city primarily felt that, and I think it's it's the um, the public input portion of the EI, EIR versus an ISM and D that they were really recommending, for lack of better. Well, I mean, all those could have been addressed, and I think the only public input in our EIR will be from the city of Santa Cruz um, and possibly a couple other regulatory agencies. I, the, the people up here completely understand the surface water, groundwater situation. The community does. It, it's, it's, it's very obvious. Um, second question I had was around, um, hey, we're actually operating those emergency inner ties under the emergency situation that we have as a result of the CZU fire. Mm -hmm. Is any of real life data going into this analysis? Because we're in, we're in effect operating as we want to operate with the exception obviously of Peavine and Clear Creek for the most part, but we're operating as we want to operate post EIR, send water from any source to any destination as we operationally view beneficial to the community and to fish. Right, and that's correct. We are, so we did take into consideration um, any data that we had that from these emergency situations. We actually used 2019 and 2020, I think, to start looking into our operational uh, planning. So we are using that. Um, as you mentioned, there are some handicaps, right? That we don't have all our diversions online right now. 
but it is giving us a good idea of what we can actually move from Felton when needed and how we would operate if we had this clearance to move water as we needed throughout our jurisdiction. Yeah, and that's going into what they're working. Right. It's somewhat of a separate analysis that CBEC is working through, but the climate change analysis will take into that that into consideration. Yeah, I mean, and at this point, I understand the diversions outside of the district, but my primary focus is on operating the district as a unified whole as opposed to diverse. Um, I mean, we just got to get much more efficient in how we're using our water uh, sources and staff to support um, delivering water to the community. If I might just add to colleagues' response, um, it's important, though, to, to recognize that even though um, the current operations are sort of like, a, 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 you know, a, a conjunctive use, a future conjunctive use plan, uh, except that right now there is no 313 acre feet from mm -hmm. Buffalo. Being oh, oh I, I, I'm completely discounting that, Mike. I, I think the cost associated with that so far, the ROI has not been proven yet. And in fact, that was going to be my next comment slash question is, you know, there was, uh, I think, an article written about how we're making great progress with Santa Cruz. Are there any concrete numbers in place relative to purchasing raw water and treated water from Santa Cruz that could be used as part of a financial analysis before we spend a lot of time and energy reviewing other aspects? Because right now, I, I don't see the ROI given the costs that are associated here. Right, so that Loch Loman feasibility study that we're hoping to enter into once we release the request for proposals, that will analyze those pieces. So the cost that's associated with bringing Loch Loman online. Uh, but these studies are somewhat- the Santa Cruz delivered numbers that would inform the financial analysis that would need to be done mm -hmm. because the article that was written did not say that. Mm -hmm. Right. They are so that when we complete that study, that's going to be fed into that. They haven't, they've re okay. what is going to what, be what fed is in? their number? What is the number? The numbers that they provide to the consultant that completes okay, the study. So they haven't yet, though. They have not. Okay. okay. Will they provide those numbers prior to the start of that effort? Because otherwise, we're just barking up a, a tree for no reason. That might be something Rick can answer. Well, because the article was not specific. Well, I don't know what, I didn't read the article. I don't know if he's one that the Mark, article. one that Mark wrote in conjunction with uh, Mr. Keeley. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know what he was talking about. Um, we're looking at part of that study. We're going to come up with several scenarios on the Lake Loma water, and one will be yeah. treated versus raw, and there will be pricing associated with that. But as far as a negotiation goes, entering into a final financial analysis before getting their number puts us at a disadvantage. We can't we can't move ahead with numbers until we sit down with them and work on numbers. There's a lot of variables and this study will work on you're, you're missing his point though. I think so. and, and, and I'm what he's what he's saying is that and I, I don't know any other way to put it, Bob, but um, if, if we do everything except get their numbers and their numbers are the last thing that comes in. We're screwed. They have the opportunity to make those numbers whatever they want to uh, We're screwed. affect our plan however we want or they want. So, so those numbers need to come first. And then we do the analysis. And then if the numbers don't work out, we can go back and try to renegotiate. But we're not at the tail end where we're basically getting wagged by their dog. That's your opinion. I mean, we're working. Well, that's with... the way negotiations work, Rick. Okay. So if you put um, yourself in a weak negotiating position, but, you're going to get screwed. Um, but your question, Bob, was, has Santa Cruz provided that? And the answer is no. That's, yeah. The answer is no. Okay. Right. Uh, we should ask them to provide it before we finalize. Before we spend any analysis. money on this effort. Because this is a big dollar number uh, to upgrade the plant or to install pipe to take treated water. And they're certainly going to have a different number for treated versus raw water. So the uh, cost to do this, um, and we're very far away from this item right now. It, yeah, but it, it's part of the but, uh, conversation. Um, the, you're going to have to br bring a uh, cost to us to do the analysis for this feasibility study, correct? 
Yes, you'll get you'll get a proposal. An RFP will come okay. in and we'll have bidders think, and we'll bring it in like we normally do. That question Bob is asking, if that's the appropriate You can ask that to the consultant. Uh, to see whether uh, we have that number from uh, the city of Santa Cruz. I mean, city of Santa Cruz is not going to deliver it if we're going to allow them not to. Um, anyway. But but we're not going to be able to answer that here. Not tonight. No, no, I got the answer I wanted, which but, is no. Correct. Right. Yes. And, I, and and we, I'm very clear about where I'm at on this. Okay, the uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was the was a process related question because I'm a little confused here. It, is what is in front of us the result of a bidding process? It is not. So, the purpose of a thirty thousand dollar maximum is not to sort of provide a seed way to not then do a bid later if in fact the project is of the scope that we're looking at now in my opinion at least when i was on the budget and finance committee that was an explicit conversation that we had so i and it sounds to me like that might have also been the situation maybe with the eir consultant where we did a thirty thousand first and then more later that was voted on by the board uh, the 30,000. It was. Okay, great. So we need to not do these kinds of things going forward because it is a workaround around the open bidding process that is the policy of this district. So, okay. Well, I'm glad we have clarity about the process, which is not great. Um, Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. Okay, I don't have any, okay. anything beyond what's already been discussed. Okay. Um, did Rincon have any allocation for <coughs> screen flow monitor or anything else that in their EIR budget? They did not. Okay. Not to do the actual data collection or work. Right. The analysis. Um, has RINCON uh, participated in the discussion for this <laughs> scope of work? Yes, so we did provide the initial scope to RINCON, and I don't know if they've actually reviewed this updated scope and budget. That's a good question. Uh, but they were initially involved with the process that we were entering into and signed off on the three tasks that we had discussed with CBEC. Um, are we doing more than, than what? we need to is kind of where I'm going with, with that question uh, with this, with, it'd be great, nice to have this data, uh, but is, is it needed to support their aspects of the AR? Because it sounds, sounds to me like that's why we're doing this additional work. Right. It's that's, the right. That's one part of it. So that'll actually give us the alternatives to be able to compare to. We'll be able to take these this data and use it to use as the alternatives for different scenarios of how we operate. But it's also going to probably support all our permitting with uh, our bypass flow restrictions that we'll probably end up with on our diversions. Okay. So it's beyond the IR. Right. It's operational aspects. Exactly. Also, as to where we can be taking water or not taking water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you mentioned um, unused potential diversions, and that's not a term that I've heard before. What are those? I, I, can, I can define that. If that comes from uh, your previous consultant who prepared the um, water availability analysis. What it is such essentially means is that <clears throat> for the uh, conjunctive use uh, plan, the district would not be increasing the diversion capacities or treatment capacities beyond anything that is existing. But as you know, your demand goes down in the winter when stream flows are higher because people don't irrigate, etc. So um, you have what, what the previous consultant called an, an unmet demand I'm uh, sorry, an, an, an unmet potential um, in your diversions in the winter that are, that are not being used. So 
that is the amount, the additional amount that is available within the existing capacity that could be uh, transferred to the South System for in new regions. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 but I want to follow up now if I can. Okay. So my understanding, though, is that we're already operating. We're going to be using data that we're gathering right now for transferring water to the South System. It, correct? Because we're, we're doing that. In the wintertime, we were transferring surface water to the South System. But are not from all. Are we factoring that into this study? I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. So you're asking with our current operations under the emergency yes, conditions. Yes, we sending surface water to Scott, our Scotts Valley system. Right. Is that being factored <clears throat> into this analysis? Uh, and not treating it as an additional diversion, but actually treating it as this is the way we're going to operate going forward. In wintertime, surface water is going to the south system, always, permanently. Yes and no. So with with the diversions, what we're looking at with the habitat study is really based on what we're taking out of the streams, right? Like we're we're trying to understand what our diversions are and how the diversions are impacting the stream conditions. Mm -hmm. Where the where we're operating what the south system moving water from Felton, it's somewhat separate. And we're also don't have all our diversions online. I'm not sure I'm capturing what you're you're well, asking here. I mean, we do have some operational experience with sending surface water to Scotts Valley. If we're not factoring that into the study, I think we're missing. Well, it'll opportunity. be factored into the EIR, but it won't necessarily be factored into the study that CBEC is working on right now for Boulder Creek. Um, the typical requirements, both under CEQA as well as uh, state and federal permitting for, for, for water diversions, if, if you're changing some operations. And, you know, granted, the, the, the operations you're, you're discussing now, they're, they're current operations, but they're very recent uh, operations. So in an EIR or in a permitting environment, you need to provide a wide range of water year types and show what your proposed future operations will do to those uh, diff to, to stream flows and therefore fisheries resources during those different water year types. So we, we, we would definitely, you know, take into consideration this period of, you know, 2020 CZU fires through now as to what um, what you've been transferring to Scotts Valley residents, or I guess it's not Scotts Valley, but the South uh, system. But but it but it's it's still just a snapshot in time, and it, it, it won't. Um, it, it's not enough for the purposes of sequel or. Uh, well, let, me, let me follow up that though, because we've had one dry year and one wet year in that yeah, extremely wet year in that period of time. We're likely to be in this situation at least for another year or two. Um, maybe we'll get lucky and we'll get a 2014 to 2018 type situation where we have uh, you know a moderate year here coming up. Um, it, it seems to me that that well, I mean, if we're not going to do it, we're not going to do it. But it seems to me we're missing an opportunity to factor in a little bit of our actual experience. What I'm hearing Mike say is um, the data record that we need to be looking at is more than just the last couple of years. It's a broader perspective. So, uh, but, 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 but the, the thing he, they talked about earlier was having four years where you went from dry to really wet in that period of time. It wasn't a long period of time. It was four years. And that's the proxy that they're using for the analysis. I, I think another way of, of responding to you might be that, um, because I think you, you, you have a very good point, in that you've been able to rely on the Felton system more heavily during these last two years, For sure, and still with stay within your bypass flow requirements, et cetera. That is definitely something that, that will figure into the analysis. But but again, it's 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 a two year period, and I understand your um, reservations or concerns or questions about Loch Lomond, but it is still that is a big chunk of water that 
whether or not it is included in the mix of water sources that you're dealing with completely changes what would be taken from Belton or the North System or the groundwater system. It, you know, you, you, you're suddenly adding over 300 acre feet per year into a system that currently doesn't have those 300. About 14, so, about 14 percent of production. It's so, not what I call massively uh, material. Um, I, I, so. I'd like to uh, see if we can segue away from the Loch Lomond aspects. I wanted to focus on what's in front of us here. Loch Lomond will be coming up, coming at some point. And I do have a couple of other specific questions to this okay. yeah. that I'd like to get back to. Um, similar to the last discussion we had, you've got $10,000 contingency here. Who controls the contingency? It would be Rick Rogers, okay. the general right. Thank manager. You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that's all of the questions that I have. I don't see Jamie back. Uh, so. I will proceed then. Um, I'd like to move that the board. Can we do we do? Can oh, we? no, I'd like to put a motion out okay. there first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that the board direct the district manager to enter into a contract with CBAC um, engineering in the amount not to exceed 101,627 for modeling and data analysis to support uh, the conjunctive use environmental impact report. Second. Okay. Uh, anybody from the public want to comment on this? Oh, do it, Bruce. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, I don't really want to comment on this item but I wanted to comment on the discussion about uh, the Loch Lomond water. Uh, and I guess my, my, my comment really is, there was a feasibility study already done in 2010. And I always felt that the missing piece was how much would the raw water cost from Santa Cruz. Um, and I guess I can imagine two simple scenarios. One would be with the district taps, uh, the pipeline in Felton, and then treats the water. And the other would be uh, that Santa Cruz uh, continues to treat 100% of the Loch Lomond water, and then some of it gets shipped up uh, to, to the South System and Scotts Valley via the pipeline that's been being built, I guess. Um, so there's two, at least two numbers. Uh, but ultimately, the city's um, those not what the cost. The, the city is going to charge based on their cost. So I think there's a financial issue here. It's not just an engineering issue. I assume that the feasibility study is going to come to the engineering committee. But this question about what the city is going to charge is a financial mm -hmm. uh, question. And so our finance director is going to need to have insight into how the city arrives at their cost. And of course, the real cost is some years in the future. Uh, and so anybody trying to project years into the future uh, is not necessarily gonna come out the way, you know, when, when that time arrives, it's not necessarily gonna be the cost that, that they calculate today. Um, so anyway, I guess my point really is that our finance director needs to have insight into the city's finances and how they arrive at their costs. Okay, thank you. Um, not seeing anybody online with any comments. Uh, Holly? Hey, hang on a sec, just one question. So I'm, pretty upset about the fact that this did not go through a bidding process. Um, if I were to vote no right now, I believe it would fail. I don't think it can pass on a two to one. Is that correct? Um, I would question counsel if she would answer that. You know, I am not going to be able to answer that question without looking at your formation, because I don't know if you require a majority of the five or a majority of the present. Bruce, five. I, 
I agree, with, I agree with Bob's take on this. That okay, okay. No. so I, I'm not going to do that this time, but the next time this happens, I'm going to vote no, okay. because we got to get out of this okay. process of cherry picking and moving things through in this fashion. We're doing it way too often, and it's not the intent of the policy that we have in place. Okay. Holly? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Um, moving on. The CZU basic waiver policy. Yes, and the uh, finance manager will present that to the board. Okay, so um, as we all know, in August of 2020, the CZU lightning fires um, severely impacted the district and its customers. 113 customers lost their home and were placed into the district's basic waiver program. Uh, what the program allows is for a waiver from the monthly basic charge for a period of up to three years from the date of the natural disaster. Uh, for these specific customers, the start date of the waiver was August 18, 2020, and the end date is August 18, 2023. Due to the difficult and lengthy process of rebuilding and permitting with the Santa Cruz County, District staff are recommending granting an extension of two years to the customers affected by the CZU disaster. Uh, this item was brought to the July 11th Budget and Finance Committee. It was first recommended to grant an extension to the customers that were in the rebuilding process, as a lot of the lots and properties are up for sale and most likely will not be rebuilt. Um, the discussion concluded that the district is granting an extension to one C to one CZU customer, that should be all or none. Um, so the the fiscal impact would be, you know, the lost revenue for a two year extension. Currently, we have sixty four customers that are still on the program. Um, that amounts to about seventy thousand um, for the two year extension, and. Um, so the the motion is to approve resolution number two for fiscal year 23-24, granting a two-year extension of the district's basic waiver program to the customers affected by the CZU fires. Okay. Thank you, Kendra. Mm -hmm. Um Jeff, you're part of the budget and finance committee. So uh, what can you tell us about <coughs> what the committee? So the bottom line, the, the committee felt it is manifestly unfair to be trying to, you know, restart billing these people when the county doesn't give permits out, and they can't get their property rebuilt, and they're not using any any of our services. Um, and as Kendra mentioned, we looked at it, the idea of well, what about people who are rebuilding versus people who aren't, and um, that gets us into the position of going out and trying to figure out who's doing what and what the status of the property is. And uh, that that just gets us in a position of making judgment calls uh, for people who have already, in most cases, been seriously abused by the system. Uh, so our consensus of the committee was to uh, proceed with uh, extending it. Now, if we wanted to extend it one year instead of two, we could do that, but I think we'll be back here next year also at the rate things are going with the county. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I assume that that's your input or any questions. That on is this. my input. Yes. Okay. All right. Bob. Yeah. The, the county torture chamber on these, these poor people has just been outrageous. Yes. Um, I mean, I, so are we saying that 49 people have been able to rebuild? I didn't think there was that many permits that have been. They either have rebuilt or they've requested their meter to be reset for whatever reason. I so think it's only about 30 that have rebuilt. Well, there's a lot of people are living in trailers and so forth yeah. Yeah. and watering. 49 and, and, are taking water. Yeah. yeah, so as long as they you know, come to us and request to have their meters set and start using water again, we, we take them out of the program and start building right. them accordingly. Okay. So um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is a no-brainer. I'm glad you guys came up with that. Anything else would have been a, a no-go for me. Um, I think we also need to look in the future at the possibility of for these parcels that go on to a longer term, we're not able to get through the county, that we designate those parcels as being exempt from any connection fee in the future should we decide to not grant extensions at some point in time. Um, I think that's the least we can do to, that we have control over that we can do to at least tell people that we're not the county in terms of how we're treating people. Um, so I, we don't have to do it today, obviously. That's something you guys ought to take a look at. But at some point, we'll probably stop the extension when there's a greater number of people and at that point in time, I would just basically say we're going to wait. Yeah, and we're going to get down to a handful of them yeah. at some point. It'll be 20 houses or, or yeah. 20 properties, or, and there may be properties that aren't even being rebuilt. Or yeah, but I still think they need to go on yes. to that. Okay, so great. Uh, thanks for doing this. This is only fair for the people that have suffered so much. Okay, so I don't have any questions on it, Kendra, and I don't see that Jamie's back yet. So. Uh, I'll move that the board approve resolution uh, number two, 2324, granting a two year extension of the district's basic waiver program to customers affected by the CZU fires. Second. Okay. Any questions from members of the public on this? Seeing none. Holly? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Fulce. Yes. Okay. Um, the Blue Ridge Tank Agreement change order. Yes. Um, on August 18, 2022, the board awarded the 2021 CIP pipeline project in the amount of $5,023,379. Project replaced approximately 8,500 lineal feet of pipeline and also um, provided for the replacement of the aging Blue Ridge uh, 40,000 gallon redwood tank with a new 160,000 gallon, which is actually um, will hold 120,000 and that extra capacity is, is for earthquake. Um, fitted with uh, level monitoring equipment um, and SCADA. Uh, the Blue Ridge tank replacement project specifications were included in the construction contract. However, at the time of the award, the State Water Board was still reviewing tanks design. Uh, anything over 100,000, uh, the state uh, does review at 100,000 gallons. Um, as a result of the State Water Board review, a mixing valve was required. The state had concern that with the increase in storage from 40,000 to 120,000 gallons, there could be a water mixing issue during low flow during the winter demand and cause dead zones uh, in the tank affecting water quality. Uh, the mixing provides for full mixing of water when the pump runs and, and when the water uh, tank exits. Uh, the cost of this change order value is, is 41,700. Um, staff is uh, recommending that the board uh, approve the change order, not to exceed forty-one thousand seven hundred, for the purpose of a uh, Tidex, Tiflex uh, potable water mixing valve. Okay. Yeah, a couple. Um, is this a? Um device that requires maintenance that is it's got moving parts or does it have moving parts that's gonna require maintenance and does it no it's uh it's, it's piping with duckbill flap uh okay. valves and then it has check valves okay yeah right yeah i mean when i hear the word mixing I... it's, they're <laughs> orientated sideways so that when it fills it mixes it causes a rotation they were used on the La pico tanks projects yep yeah Good. Um, second question, are there any people that have low pressure that will um, continue to have low pressure with a new tank? That is, anybody that's at an elevation that does not grant, give them sufficient pressure for this tank? Yes. Are they getting a, are we doing a pressure um, increase? No. Okay. 
um, we might want to take a look at that. Not for this project, but as a policy. Those homes already have pressure systems of their own. Yeah, I understand that. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Good. Um, I don't see we have a choice here. Okay. Um, do we have mixing valves in our other large tank? The new ones when we replace Lion Tank has a mixing, and some have the piping set up so where water comes in at the top and goes out right. at the bottom. Right. But the so state we, has changed that to they prefer more of a mixing. Right. Um, we awarded this last year, this time. Uh, we've been putting mixing valves in for longer. Than a year is what it sounds like. Then. Yes, like, like like Garrett said, we put them in on the uh, on Pico tanks, and as we move forward now, any tank over a hundred thousand, okay. we will put in the design, um, so knowing the state part will, of the district, and it will be part of the bid process. Okay. Just, I mean, do these things need to be included in a policy or something? No, engineering part standards. Of, part of their engineering standards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, I don't have any further questions on that. Uh, then I'd like to direct the district manager to amend the existing contract with JMB Construction in an amount not to exceed uh, 41700 for the purchase and installation of a Tide Flex potable water mixing valve for the Blue Ridge tank replacement. I'll second. Okay. Any comments from the public on this? Seeing none. Holly? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Okay. Uh, the uh, item F, the capital reserve policy. Yes, the uh, finance manager will start the discussion. Okay, back in 2020, there was discussion of developing a capital asset management plan for a camp that staff can use to help develop a comprehensive long-term financial plan. The camp will give insight into financial capacity for the best way to plan and achieve long-term long objectives. In October of 2021, the master plan was completed, which provided a capital improvement program, which evaluate, evaluated the district's water system and recommended capacity improvements necessary to service the needs of sorry. Um, existing users and for servicing the future growth of the district. The master plan summarized pipeline, valve, booster station, and reservoir improvements for a total system cost, water replacement cost of around 75 million. Um, so while the master plan outlines uh, improvements, the district has assets outside of the master plan that have required annual maintenance that the district needs to incorporate in the overall capital replacement cost. Um, internally in 2021, staff began working on the camp, but due to staffing and workload constraints, it was put on hold. Um, developing a camp internally is a huge list, lift as each asset should be reviewed individually and updated accordingly to have a uniform data system. The district has around 500 active assets. Um, staff understands the importance of developing a comprehensive camp, not only to help with budgeting, but also give a better idea of the district's short and long-term financial obligations. Staff are looking for input from the board on the next steps for developing a camp. Um, this item has been discussed um, at a few committees, and um, Director Fultz have, has also brought it up in the past. Um, so we are just looking for now that you know it's come to our attention the importance of it, and we want to finally get this completed input on the overall camp. All right. I, yeah, I think regrettably um, you're. Maybe my question wasn't clear. Uh, it wasn't a question about whether or not we should have a camp. The question was about the basis for the reserve calculation. Um, because 
the basis for the reserve calculation in the 21-23 budget was 150 million. That was an estimate of the full capital replacement cost of the entire system. Now, at the time that number was estimated mm -hmm. in 2019, when I was on the Budget and Finance Committee, mm -hmm. that was a estimate that we all kind of said, yeah, it makes sense based on some numbers we threw around, but that the inventory would provide us the basis for doing a better estimate quicker once that inventory was done. And, and due to the fire and all that, it took a little longer to do, but you know, we got it done finally. Right. So, so the, the question was, why 75 million? Given 75 million, I mean, can't, I mean, that would be a magic number to go from 150 to 75 million for the capital replacement cost of our entire system. Right. That, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's the question. The okay. question is not about camp. The question is about what's the number you use to calculate 2.5% for reserves? Because what, what happens right now in the budget, this is the official budget of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, is that the reserve that we need is only about 1.8 million. If we had had that reserve at the time of the CZU fire, we would have run out of cash mm -hmm. because we used about 4 million. The reserve number is not responsible. And if you use 75 million as the basis for calculating 2.5%, you're going to get a number that just has no basis in reality. Correct. So I, that's the question. It isn't camp. It isn't spending lots of time. It isn't doing any of that. It's taking the basic information in the um, inventory and doing a very fast calculation. For example, we have about, according to the numbers I went through and in the inventory, 966,105 feet of pipe of all sizes. If we just say, based on what we've encountered recently, $400 a foot for that, the replacement cost of 966,105 feet is 386,442,000. That's one input into the full replacement cost of our system. That is five times 75 million. Mm -hmm. We could go to other um, parts of this and do the similar calculation based on what's, what's in the inventory. 2.5% of 383 million is basically 8 million, rough, roughly more or less. Mm -hmm. That's the target for the capital improvement reserve if we use numbers that actually reflect the replacement value of the system. That then feeds directly into the rate increase process that we're going into, because if we feed 1.8 million into that process, we're giving the community a very distorted picture of our true financial condition. And you can't expect the community to vote on a rate increase based on distorted values. Right. These all, these all flow together. So I think, based on the inventory, it took me about four hours to go through it and come up with a number that's roughly $425 million. It's not a full camp. It doesn't deal with the other question about how we then put this into a plan for replacement. But at least it gives you a number that is more grounded in reality than 75 million. And we can then amend the budget mm -hmm. to reflect that. That's the question that I posed. Right. So uh, so my in my response to that is I I think taking your spreadsheet that you did in four hours or whatnot and having an overall camp would help to identify the district's overall asset replacement cost. And I guess I didn't really respond to your direct question, but I we need to re revise that 75 million number that was initially input because that was in inadvertently, I, I was misunderstanding the master capital master plan. Um, so I think if we we need to do one of these, anyways because it's going to help with long-term budgeting and all that um but i do agree that it needs to be amended in the budget and i think this will help there's there's two things you can do though yeah we, we, we can do something quick 
Yeah. And we can get within, let's say, 85% of what the number may be, mm -hmm. which for the purposes of what we're going through now with right. rate increase and community relations is better than 75 million. In parallel, if you right. want to do a camp and we want to allocate resources to do it, yeah. we can do that too, but it's not an either or thing, in my no. view. We, we have a short term need yeah. for a best <laughs> estimate and a longer term need for a process that provides us with an ongoing, maintained, right. uh, and reasonable estimate of what uh, the total capital assets are. Right, because if you take the, if the next step is you then take these assets, you assign a life, you do some algebra, and you come up with how much you should be spending yes. every year yes. on capital improvement, that number is right now roughly, without debt payments and other extraneous things, it's roughly six and a half million. We spend roughly three. Yeah. Okay. That's the start of a more in-depth conversation around camp. Mm -hmm. But at least those numbers give you something that you can plug into the rate increase process that's closer to reality than what we currently have. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so thank you for that that either preview or clarification. That since <laughs> I understand this or I think I'm understanding this memo was generated from question from Bob to yeah, but I didn't. But when I read it, I was like, well, I I didn't ask this. I, I understand yeah. that. Yeah, I understand. This. But that's kind of where the, this. Well, let's not kind of let's not throw out the good enough in in pursuit of the perfect. I, I agree. I agree. Right. So perfect so, is the enemy of good. Right. Exactly. If this drive. If this drives what we need, or if something like this. I don't want to say take bobs, but yeah, something like this, quick and dirty, um, and eight hours on it instead, but supports rate increase right. discussions. And and that we have to do it fairly quickly because we've got Raph Thomas working on numbers, right? Right. But, um, yeah. So uh, thank you for that clarification, Bob. I think. I think I was, I was trying to get to. So where does this camp? How does that relate to the capital reserve policy? <laughs> because you introduced something about the capital reserve at the beginning of the discussion, but then transitioned into the. So uh, bottom line, the capital reserve number that was used in the budget was too low, and right. so with the rate study, we need to make sure that gets amended. And right. I think we should move forward with completing the camp. So that we have, you know, a consistent document that yes. shows all of our assets and replacement costs. And well, I would life. comment that no one on the current budget and finance committee has looked at this stuff. Um, well, I looked at it several times when I was okay. But uh, you're not on right. the committee currently. Right. The people that right. are currently on the committee have not discussed this. Okay. And this needs to be discussed on that committee. Agreed. And yes. we also need to. So, but, but but time time is short here because we have the right rate study underway. So we need to. If we, I, there's a two prime. Effort. If we if we agree that 75 million is not because I hear you say 75 million is not a correct number. Yeah, that was and it should incorrect. be something significantly we can more. Blow that with three tanks. <laughs> well, it should be significantly yeah. more than that. Uh, but we don't know how much more significant. Okay. Um, and, so and we're so we're taking the document that Director Foltz provided and okay. worked on, um, and obviously he did it, you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think you were saying so yeah, it needs some updating, but okay. I think that could. Yeah. I have not seen that, but it sounds like a very good start. Okay. And, yeah. Uh, um, so I think that we could use that in our discussions with Raftelis in the rate study to. Okay, I'm happy okay. to share it with you, but we have to do it in a way that complies with the Brown Act. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so I put think it this on the is appropriate. So put it on the agenda for the finance committee, yes. and then I'll pick it up as part of the. And Andrew can take that analysis, and, and mm -hmm. if if you say yes, we're going to go with this as a starting point. Fine. Yeah. Bring that back to the budget finance committee yeah. to have some discussion as to yeah. how do we get to there. Okay. Yeah. And by putting it on the budget and finance agenda, then it's, we, 
<laughs> sharing the document. Um, and it's don't agree. I don't disagree that updating this camp is important, but I think as everybody here is saying, two separate things that we can be doing. Yes. One is this much quicker analysis. Mm -hmm. Because I see in your in the two memos that you put together of we've been struggling to get this information and we can't get this information yeah. and staff hasn't had the time to do any of the rest of this there's, there's and an we urgency. can't get there yeah. and we can't get there but there's an urgency here that for the for the camp is what I'm seeing mm -hmm. that's different than coming up with a best estimate mm -hmm. of what we want to put in here. For a right. budgetary approach. Yep. But um, the capital reserve policy, how do we get, how do we decide how much we need for capital reserves? Then? It's it's basically two and a half percent of the district's total asset replacement cost. Okay. Yeah. All right. That was established back in yeah. So the, in the first prior, biennial budget. Yeah. Prior, 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 I'm good with that. Yeah. Prior to twenty eighteen. Prior to twenty eighteen, our reserves had dipped yeah. really low, yeah. and there was a lot of angst around that relative to preparing for emergency. So there was a big push to try to get that reserve up at least into the three or four million, based on the uh, one. 50 replacement cost. If obviously it goes up, it would need to go up commensurate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't think there's a motion here. I don't there's think no there's motion. a motion. I think this was go discuss this. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, I will move that we re refer this issue to the Budget Finance Committee. We don't, to, we don't need to. I don't think we, we don't need a motion. Motion. I don't think we need a motion. I think no. that, uh, that's. That's your direction. Yeah, where we do need to go to the public. Agreed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, after I see if uh, Jamie has any question or comment on this, now that I see she's back. back. I am, but unfortunately, I missed um, much of the discussion, so I, I'm going to abstain yeah. on this item. Okay. All right. Um, any. Uh, Questions or comments on this discussion from the public? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move on um, to uh, the drought status. Yes, and the environmental planner will present this to the board. Okay, thank you. So according to the district's Boulder Creek rain gauge, the San Lorenzo Valley area received approximately 71 inches of rain this water year compared to the district's historical rainfall average of 49 inches. And while the district still encourages customers to use water efficiently, staff are recommending the stage two water shortage designation be lowered to a stage one water shortage designation. District's customers are averaging approximately 58 gallons per capita per day or GPCD of usage. And since 1995, per capita water usage varied from a high of 104 GPCD and in 2006 to a low of 70 GPCD. Overall, per capita consumption has decreased, which is most likely due to past drought outreach, manda state mandated water use reduction targets, more efficient appliances and plumbing, and conservation efforts made by district customers. A summary table of consumption from 2017 to 2022 is attached as Exhibit C, and this also includes winter versus summer usage. The Environmental and Engineering Committee reviewed this information at its August meeting, and both district staff and the Environmental and Engineering Committee are recommending the Board of Directors drop the current Stage 2 water shortage declaration to a Stage 1. Staff is prepared to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, yes, I do want to say that the Engineering and Environmental Committee uh, discussed this at some point, uh, and we ended up concurring with staff's uh, recommendation to. Uh, drop this from a stage two to a stage one. So uh, Bob and I are both on that committee or anybody from the public that's interested in that. Uh, so I'd like to hear from Jeff. Okay, so I only have one comment. I, I don't object to what you're doing there, but you quoted a number of you know, gallons per day mm -hmm. usage and that that's per person or I don't remember exactly what the measurement was. Right. Uh, I have seen 
several articles in the Mercury News over the last six months uh, suggesting that the population has actually gone down in this general area, uh, perhaps substantially. We could, to the extent that, you know, looking at one of the articles a couple of months ago, we could actually be down 6,000 people in the San Lorenzo Valley alone. I don't believe that at all. I, I find that hard to believe also, but, um, you know, they're looking at moving vans going out, moving vans coming in and things like that. Um, I'm not sure how we would go about this, but I do think we ought to take a look at uh, whether or not uh, we've had a population decline. Uh, but that, that, that doesn't necessarily affect the made drought it, thing. Right. Yeah. Um, it's the uh, drought declaration I understand. aspects that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just responding to right. some of the numbers okay. that were used. To, okay. Any other? No, I'm fine with changing. I'm, I'm fine with the recommendation. Okay. All right. Bob? Yeah, so in the discussion in the engineering committee, we actually had made some recommendations on numbers that I, I think I want to review quickly here to provide a little bit more context. I believe the numbers that you're quoting here, 104 and 70, are indoor and outdoor uh, water usage That's over right. the course of the year. Let's keep in mind that the California mandate, state mandate, is 55 going to 50 gallons per day indoor usage. It is that number to me that is the one that um, we have, I think, reached an asymptote or are pretty pretty close to it. Because when you take an average of, let's say, December, January, February, or November, December, January, uh, and you use a population number, uh, which I'll talk about here in a minute, you're down more in the high 30s, low 40 range. We, we are substantially under the state goal. And continuing to pound on people around their indoor usage, I think we're getting diminishing returns here. We'll get some efficiencies naturally as people continue remodeling houses and the like, but to pound on people about it, I think is counterproductive at this point, in my opinion. The population number that I use, and this is something I haven't looked at since the election, is uh, registered voters, an assumption of about 90 to 95%. Uh, of the people in our area registered to vote, yep. um, plus uh, school attendance numbers. Mm -hmm. And that comes out to about 23 to 24,000 people. Uh, I've seen as low as 21 and as high as 26 for our district. Um, and depending on which number you use, you wind up either in the low uh, or the high 30s or low 40s, mm -hmm. basically I come up with it. Overall, the message to the community is on indoor water usage, you're doing great. And keep doing what you're doing. That's my message anyway. Um, the, the, the second part of this has to do with the drought stage. I also want the community to understand that we've been in stage two drought since 2014, 2013 or 2014. That is, even in 2017, when we had the massive water year, we did not roll it back at all. Therefore, the 10% that we are asking people to conserve the year before last would have taken us to stage three, but for whatever reason, the district and the board chose not to do that, but just a jawbone around, let's get another 10%. To be clear in communicating to our community, if we're asking for more conservation, we need to take it to the stage that it should be at to our policy. Otherwise, why have the policy? Either that or just get rid of the policy and we just make it up as we go along. So that was some of the additional context that we talked about in the engineering committee meeting. And I'm hopeful that going forward, we communicate clearly around indoor water usage uh, to make sure that people understand that we're doing really well there. These numbers, I think, give people a, not a great number to look at when it's comparing to the indoor water usage mandates of 50 to 55, which is what people read about, and that we do a better job on communicating what the actual drought status is of our district per our policy and not just job owner. Uh, if it's a serious enough to go to stage three, we ought to declare a stage three. Okay. Uh, Jamie, any questions or comments on this? 
drop stage change? Yeah, um, I I agree with reducing um, our our drought status to a level one, but I'm just wondering, Carly, is there any? I don't know. Are, are there different tiers of incentives for uh, water districts to uh, go through the process of classifying drought conditions? I mean, is there anything that we're like going to be missing out on if we reduce the drought status from a level two to level one in terms of, you know, opportunities for I don't know, grant reimbursements or anything? Is there any reason not to do this, I guess? I would say no at this time. So with considering grant funding, we can we still can make an argument that we will most likely in the future face drought again. Um, so dropping down to the stage right now, which reflects our actual conditions, probably makes the most sense. And then, we, as Bob mentioned, we can use our policy to go back into a higher stage as needed. Can, can I also okay. address that as well? If, to if me, you... it is really important that we communicate what the reality and truth is of our situation. I am very uncomfortable with the notion of maintaining a drought status for the sole purpose of we think we're going to get grant funding if we do that. That is not that is not the kind of message that I'm comfortable making. So I'm, I'm glad that we're going down to level to uh, stage one. If we have a wet year this year, I would be in favor of moving it down to stage zero. I think the only reason we did talk about that. I think the only reason we didn't was because it's only been one year. Uh, it's only been one year. and. The other aspect that I want to point out that uh, Rick pointed out to me at the committee meeting was uh, we still do not have surface water sources, right. Right. significant surface water sources back online yeah. in the Boulder Creek area. So we're um, hampered or limited by what we don't have there. Um, and um, personally, whether we're under a stage two or one, or no stage, our customers are, are conserving. Of course. Look at look at our water usage numbers as compared to uh, the past three year average. They continue to be 10% below, 10% below. Uh, I've been seeing that for the last two years, at least since I've been involved. Board. Not so, only that, Mark, but, but Santa Cruz has some of the lowest water usage of anybody in the state. We do a really good job on this. Mm -hmm. Santa Cruz County. Yeah. The right. districts in the Santa Cruz County. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So uh, given that, um, I don't have any other questions on this or point that I want to make. So uh, I want to move that the board directors lower um, the stage two water shortage to stage one water shortage based on the um, anticipated water shortage of 10% or less for the water year 2023. No second. Okay. Uh, any comments from the public on this? Seeing none. Uh, Holly? President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, Director Falls? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. And passes. Okay. Um, we can now move on to the consent agenda. Um, does anybody uh, want to take any objections to the minutes that are currently presented in front of us here? Um, it's uh, approaching nine o'clock and the board has been here for three hours now. Uh, I wanna uh, propose that the uh, district reports, if we have any questions on those, that we defer that until the next meeting. Without any objections? No, uh, none for me. Okay. All right. Lovely. Uh, is this where I should interject a comment about uh, the Felton Heights tank? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, John, but I need to adjourn the meeting first. Um, and then say it. Um, and, and then you can, uh, right, as when the meeting is over, okay. you can do that. 
Okay, John, I can meet with you after the meeting, give you a quick update if you'd like. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, given that, I think we can adjourn the meeting and uh, we're done. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Uh, Good night.